I'm uh, Jörg Blomman. I work at uh, Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics in Switzerland. Can you bend over it, please? <laughs> <laughs> Driven by our ontologies and spark endpoints, 
but it doesn't look like your semantic web application because it's designed to put a simple concept of a biologist into a picture that he or she understands. But still, behind this picture, there's a spark of endpoint for when you need to get to the information. Talking about Sparkle. Sparkle or play, it really isn't very different. Information is information. It doesn't matter how you write it down. You can have hundreds of clay tablets, and that's fine if you have infinite funding and lots of PhD students or slaves or postdocs. Unfortunately, it isn't work like that for us. We have a world where funding is scarce and we actually want to do new things. So clay tablets doesn't work in the age of next-gen sequencing. But the concepts stay the same. Still have <coughs> basic knowledge written down. And we've had a lot of approaches to get this data out once you've recorded it. Just a few common query languages are SQL, first standardized in 1986, talking about relation algorithm, or for pre based data in XML formats where you patch that and have query, and Sparkle, which is new in 2008, and finally very useful with Sparkle 1.1, standardized this year. And you might say that it's standardized, but for some of these things it's not true. We all know SQL, everybody who's a programmer has at one point in their life worked with a relational database. Yet, after all those years, since that first paper in 69 about relational databases, SQL hasn't been standardized in practical terms. Take this example, where you have the simplest thing about what to do with a database when you come to it for the first time. It's What's in the database? You would think that this would be standardized after 24 years or 34 years. It isn't. Every database has its own way of asking this very simple question. Is it show tables, as in MySQL? Is it select table names from user table? It's one of the many ways to do it in Oracle database. Or this tables, which is as how it's done in DB2. The same is true for schemas. They're very similar, but not transferable. One database says, well, you should be using bar chart 2. Other ones say you should be using text as a data type. It very much puts implementation details hard in your very basic schemas. This means that if somebody, one institute decides to use an Oracle database, and other institutes decides to use a MySQL database, it's very difficult to communicate just between these two databases. It's not hard work, but it is a lot of work in aggregate. Every time somebody moves and has a technical decision made, it kind of enforces it on all their users. There's a certain cost associated with it. And to be honest, the database vendors like that cost, because it means that once you've chosen for Oracle, or you've chosen for IBM, you are committed to it. And that means that you're going to pay them again and again, even if it's no longer the tool that you need to use. XBAN and XQuery for XML is much better. It's fully standardized. You can do everything you want to. There's that queries. The problem is, it is key based. So that means that if your data is not in tree format, then you can't really use it. You always have to hack around it because your query language is not powerful. The second thing is it always assumes that everything you want to query is in one document. If you have more than one document, it's very difficult to query your cost. It also always assumes that all your data is in one system. That's no longer possible without budgets. You can no longer download all the databases that you want and then put them into one computer just so that you can do any great queries. Sparkle is different. It's very young. Only three years, only five years. It's very standardized in the marketplace. And it talks about graphs. And graphs are basically the most complicated data structure in computer science. But because it's the most complicated uh, modeling way of modeling your information, all the other formats can be expressed as graphs. You can express your relational algebra as a graph algebra. You can express your axpath. Queries as a graph algebra. 
Sparkle is also very nice because it doesn't assume anything about how you store the data or if there's any data stored at all. It also just assumes that these days all your data is available via HTTP or the network, even if it's internal or password protected, but at least the access methods are the same. And that is a very nice result is that you can spark it against basically anything. You can spark it against relational databases, programs, triple stores, key value point points, and mathematics platform formats, or even common separate file uh, values. At all times, your API is formal queries. It doesn't matter that how somebody decided to store it on disk, it just means it's accessible. It's an universal API for data. And I'm going to show an example of how you can implement this for common separated value files and for biophematic file in the next section. So first by talking about what is the CSVs and how can we represent this as um, Sparkle queries. But the first thing you need to realize is that common separated values is just relationships between elements in the same row. The relationship goes with the headers. And if you just think about it, these all these lines are just implicit graphs. So a problem so in zip and seven is apparently related in some way to all those numbers. And apparently that position one is again related to some kind of zero and some kind of plus. You have all that meaning, there's a semantics associated with each of these values, and there's a relationship to them. In them, in every line of that common separated value file is a graph waiting to come out. And because there is a graph in there, it means you can also sparkle against it. Because sparkle works on relations between things, where you have a subject, a resource, a value, and then there's a relation to another value. Because this is implicit in this model, you can always query on it. And in the end, contrary to values, there's just relationships between those fields. So there's a start, which is related to an end in some way. And if you express that, a standard methodology, we're using cloud over last year, where we say something is a position with begin and end as a reference sequence. Then you can actually do the following Because all those little uh, start and follow ends can be replaced by sparkle variables. For example, this one, where you just say start, end, fill in the blanks, which is what the sparkle is. Of course, you might say it's a lot of work to implement the Sparkle API. <laughs> Actually, it isn't. For, to do this, you only need to implement one method. This is true for Java, I have checked it out. This is true for Ruby RDF, where you just have to implement a single method and you have a full Sparkle one with one line engine. It doesn't always have to be fast as the optimizations, but as a coding work, it means you have to do one method and you have a fully sparkle one to one implied at the double store. And this just basically it means give me any predicate, any sorry, any subject, give me any predicate, give me any object, and then return just the list of predicates that match. In the empty case, where you have an empty triple store, you always return an empty list. So to give up very simple implementation. This is enough to give you a fully Sparkle 1.1 compliant database. It is empty, but it's fully compliant. This method implements is not a lot of code. I did it for Sparkle to bed. It's a few lines of code. It's actually 14 lines of code to make it work. And then it's a few hundred lines of code to make it fast enough. And it is fast enough. We can, you can see it on the algorithmic level. Because if you take you know, our famous big organization for algorithmic performance, it is very similar to the other approaches that we have already. If our little Sparkle engine detects that everything that you query about is going to be on one line, for example, because we share a subject between all objects and we know that we never share a subject that crosses lines, or we notice that a predicate is not in the store because it's not in our basic methodology. We know how quick our program is going to be 
and that it's just going to be as fast as it takes to read all the lines you need to. And of course, if somebody already did some optimization, like from that class or Digweek, where you have programs like Tabix, George Parker and Point can use this kind of knowledge as well, where you have decisional indexes. So it's exactly as fast as any other approach you will use, because the limit, the query speed, is basically limited by how fast can you read your file from this. <coughs> if you actually do interesting queries and you start doing joins, it is also just as fast as your other approaches, because it's the same algorithmic complexity <coughs> as anything that you would write in a single line of Perl. But there are still differences, because there are some strengths involved by giving everything a single API. And that means it isolates your data format from how you query it. So no longer will you ever have to have a problem that because you decided at some point to store everything in single files, and later on you find out, well, the single files is pretty good for what I was doing four years ago, but now I want to do different types of queries, so I'm going to load it up into a very expensive triple score with lots of memory, because I want to do very complicated queries. It doesn't mean that all your old tools are broken. But all your old tools just, well, consume Sparkle. So instead of consuming Sparkle against flat files, you then consume Sparkle against the triple screen. So the only thing that changes is performance and how much disk space you use. It doesn't change the answer. It just changes how quickly you get the answer. But it's also very easy to make data available on the web. Because there's so many serialization formats for RDF that are web friendly, like JSON LD or the Sparkle results in JSON. What's also very nice is you only have one program that needs to reach your files. So there's only a single thing that points optimized. That means if somebody actually does a little bit of work and makes your Sparkle code faster, makes it concurrent, makes it know how many disk spittles you have in your data and your array, knows but the caching infrastructure of your hardware, you can actually have one single program that uses it. Currently, when we always write a single line script to do a bit of work, it means that if you make one script faster, it doesn't make all your other scripts faster. You then have to go to all your scripts and do the same work over and over again because you have so many access points to the data. Of course, what's really nice is you take this approach of leaving the data in bad files or other file formats that you use today. It means that the tools that you use today that access these file formats still work. So you don't have to re-architect, you don't have to rework things that already work. Of course, it's more work to do it to start with because it's not a lot of work to do these little spark to CSP transformations. But still, it takes a few weeks to get it right. There's some latency involved because, well, the Sparkle query has to be translated into a program, and that's latency. It also has a little bit of higher complexity for programmers to figure out what's going on. It's not so easy to just split the query into two and see why it's not joining the way you expect to, the way you would do with, you know, just that query, putting it into a file and looking at the file, what's going on. However, the real strength is not getting this anymore. This is not pleasant to me, and I know Perl, I know what it's doing, it takes a bit of effort. But if I show this to a biologist, they're really not happy. They're losing a lot of dollar signs, but they're not seeing the money. <laughs> <I'm> not. <laughs> <laughs> At least here, you see a lot of question marks because there's lots of questions. But it is more consistent and there is more value even in these kind of formatted queries that a biologist who is interested in enough to figure out what you are doing as a bioinformatician can read it with guidance. That is not true for this case, no matter how much whiskey you give it. And this kind of queries can work, it's probably bad can work for databases that are only accessible for your FTP and do so in a well-known manner. 
And this really gets to the point. Sparkle is at your service. It's not just one end. It's a network. You can use service to query two databases at once. You just basically ask database one, hey, I know you have a lot of information, but go and ask that other database which has lots of information as well. Because only together, working together, can you get the new knowledge that the biologist needs. And this gives a lot of big benefits. Because everybody knows we are living in a world of big data where our disks are getting cheap, but our data is getting more expensive sooner than we think we're getting cheap. And in this world, it's a lot cheaper to upload a small query of one kilobyte than to download half a terabyte of data. Of course, somebody still has to host a Sparkle at that point. But you can imagine that a single copy of 500 gigabyte database is a lot cheaper to maintain on a global scale than 16,000 copies. And with Sparkle, this is doable via the web, no matter where you are. I mean, you could almost have done this on a plane, because the internet connections in your plane these days, almost everyone on the planet can access data for places via HTTP. And this means, you know, that form people by the input data, you know, you don't have to worry about it anymore. You don't have to find the time to download it every month, download it into your own database, and it up. And it's not, of course, info, it's GenBank and DBJ and all those other databases that have lots of value, but it's hidden away because it's too expensive to do cross database queries. And when we find out every few months when we start cleaning up our hard disk again because we're running out of hard disk space because our SANs are full, the easiest way to compress data is not to have 100 copies on it. <coughs> and if you look at a database like Inprod, which is downloaded thousands of times every month, you can see that there's a lot of money being wasted in bioinformatics by just copying the same databases over and over again when we don't have to. And the nice really thing, the really nice thing is that Sparta endpoints, they are a network. It's like email. There was no fun when it was one person using email. It's no fun when there's six billion people using emails because now it's all about work. But in between, there's a lot of value being generated. Because everybody has, you know, little endpoints. The same for the phone network. It was no fun. fun when it was just two people with a phone. But now that everybody has a mobile phone, it works the same way. As long as you can make, make calls, you're happy. And of course, there's always going to be people for who the phone network doesn't work today, because we dropped the phone in the dishwasher and everything else. But as long as mobile phones work most of the time, or the vast majority of the time, and you can depend on most calls going through, there's a lot of value in that. It doesn't have to be about 100% uptime for 100% of the people. It has to be 100% uptime for some of the people. And you can see that more and more databases are becoming more and more available in this world. There's a lot of here and here at the Of course, there's a new part. I don't exactly do the new part. That's my pride and joy. And there's more and more databases also at EBI. We've done a lot of work this year at making databases available via Sparkle, via RDF, for you to consume when you really need access, when you want to ask the query that we as a programmer didn't think about because you're doing novel and exciting science. And it's not just these databases that are connected. It's many, many more databases that are outside of our network that I don't know about because I also have a better job, but that are accessible for people who need it. It can be your little PhD thesis database from 10 years ago, or it can be the largest database that you can imagine, but it's all possible to just interlink them via this wonderful Sparkle company. With this optimistic message of more and more Sparkle endpoints becoming available,